Hi, my name is Dawn Davies and I am the head buyer for the Whiskey Exchange and I am so, so happy to have one of my best friends on the screen sharing the platform with me tonight and someone who, well, we started the project that we're going to talk about uh, almost, I would say, a little just under a year ago and actually it was probably on a Tuesday that we, we did this and I remember tasting these rums and just being like, OMG. Um, and Maggie and I will talk a little bit about sort of what we're doing. Um, so I'm super excited to have the amazing Maggie Campbell here today. Now, uh, we know she has departed from Privateer. Um, so she's been really, really generous. And the guys at Privateer have been really super happy to have her just talking through these babies that were ours. Um, what I am going to ask you tonight is we're not going to talk about her departure. We're not going to answer any questions on that because that's for the future. We're going to talk about these amazing rums that we have before us because it's what it's in the glass that counts. So Maggie, girl, super happy to have you here tonight. Thank you. Or this afternoon in your case. Yeah, it's sunny and bright here. No, it's my, you know, I'm thrilled to be here. So excited to work with you. So excited we got to do this project and that we get to share it with everyone now. And it was exciting to see how many people wanted to like try this rum. That was so cool. So it's great. And then the funny thing is Maggie, I was like, I'm not sure how it's going to do. I'll put it on two per person. And I was like, it went. And I was like, oh, didn't save any. <laughs> <laughs> I'll learn for the next cask. <laughs> but yeah, no, like, I, you know, I think I remember the first time that we met. Um, so for those of you who don't know the story of how Maggie and I met, we, um, we actually have a mutual friend in common, uh, a guy called Michael Vashon, who is absolutely amazing and wonderful and is the, the guy that heads up uh, Maverick. And he said to me, Dawn, I've got a friend who's doing her Master of Wine. Um, I think I should hook you up because I had just passed my Master's of Wine. And he email introduced us, didn't he, Maggie? Mm -hmm. And it, it was kind of one of those things that I started helping Maggie with her, um, her tastings and stuff uh, as much as I could and being quite a few miles apart. But we'd never actually met for, what, a year? More. Right, right. You were like coaching me and studying and tasting notes and blind tasting for like a year before we ever really like talked about rum or anything else. <laughs> yeah. I just remember every now and then I'd be like, I need to taste your stuff. And Maggie would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I come to the UK. <laughs> so we were super excited last year. We, we actually met, no, last year, the year before we met in person at rum show. Mm -hmm. at Ian show. So that was like the moment I think we were like, yeah, there's a reason we've been talking for a year now. Now let's get this shit on the road. Yeah. <laughs> or on the sea. So Maggie, I mean, like, I think one thing that I, when I started looking more into American rum, and we've talked about this quite a lot, just so you know, everyone, it might be a bit of a geek fest tonight. There will be a yeast conversation. Yeast will come up. <laughs> um, but uh, I was really amazed by the, the history of America and rum, and in, in particular Massachusetts, has a huge history with rum. Can you kind of, you know, give us a little bit of a background and, and how you think that's influenced what's going on now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, rum, of course, had its roots all over, you know, the colonized part of, you know, the Caribbean as well as the Eastern seaboard. Uh, here on North America. So North America in general, of course, including the Caribbean islands, all really affected by this, this culture of colonialization. And part of that was the production of sugar. And in the production of sugar, the waste stream that is molasses that became rum. And so molasses, you know, is traded all up and down the coast of the Eastern side of the United States. Um, as it became known. Um, and so there were distilleries all over there. And rum itself was very stable, very useful. Um, it was used as currency. Uh, and there's all these amazing old sayings, you know, if you get a gallon of molasses to a gallon of rum, like that's the base level quality. And if you get a little more than rum than you had molasses, it's low quality. And if it's a little less, it's good quality. So there's all these old sayings from the colonial era. Um, there were over 100 distilleries here in Massachusetts um, and lots of illicit distilling. And uh, there were even food riots around access to sugar and molasses and rum all across New England as well. And it really was 
America's drink until, you know, we see World War I, a lot of, you know, ethanol being made for the war effort and then prohibition and World War II. And that's when a lot of rum, of course, was still coming up from the islands. And then you really see in the 1960s, this big push to make whiskey America's spirit. Um, but it's really interesting for me to see old whiskey ads that call whiskeys like types of rum, yeah. <laughs> uh, because rum just meant alcohol in the early part of the uh, newly created Amer uh, United States of America. And I think, you know, there's some amazing stories of like Paul, um, Paul Revere having a tot of rum as he was kind of going to into the, deliver the message as, uh, you know, the famous, famous message. And you know, there's some really amazing, the real McCoy, parking outside on his boat in um new york and uh, you know I, think I never realized that there was such a history um there and especially massachusetts being the kind of the, the soul of that history and actually the one thing we kind of discussed that i was kind of like well what do you think american rum is and i said like you know when we were talking about flavor because maggie and i always talk a lot about flavor i was like i don't know this is this is kind of cedar box kind of roundness as a saltiness it's not i can see american whiskey in the rum it's a really really interesting kind of thing to kind of think about and you know i always think it's quite interesting we talk a lot about terroir and i think we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit especially when we talk about the cellars and stuff um but you know what for you and sort of do you think embodies that idea of a american you know like what what's in your head on that yeah, I think for like, you know, continental North American rum, there is often like a linear style on the palate. And I think that is very terroir. I think it is those more northerly climates. We get those, you know, big swings, whereas in, you know, the Caribbean part of North America, it's going to be, you know, or Puerto Rico part of the US, it's going to be a lot more temperate. It's going to be 85 degrees every day. And, you know, it doesn't get too hot, hot, hot in the summer. It's quite warm, don't get me wrong, but it's not the same as like, you know, 110 degree day up here in Massachusetts. Um, and it's definitely not the same as a negative 20 degree day here in the middle of winter. And I think that temperature change creates that, that linear style. I also think that, you know, the whiskey know-how is just mm -hmm. around. Um, and that does sort of, creep into a lot of the rum making and you know people you know they eat and they drink whiskey so much it becomes a natural part of their internalized palate and when they're looking for good flavors bad flavors etc and then also the use of new oak I think that's something that's very different for my rums when I share them with my peers in the distilling industry in rum you know new American oak is you know not something that is like used at all it's always used bourbon used this use that um but coming from a culture where new oak is prominent especially in the colonial era if you would scrape out a barrel and fresh char it if you had salted cod in it you know you would get that newer oak uh flavor and so that kind of presence of a, of a little bit of oak and that firmness and that linearity it's very, you know, um, I think Kate Perry kind of jokes that it's like American confidence, you know, like it just kind of has that push on the palate. It's very different. And I think when you taste, I know it's American, you know, I know it is. And I don't know if it's because I grew up there and, you know, I, you have, you're right. You have that culture, you know, of, of drinking and tasting these, these very specific American kind of notes, whether it's a whiskey or bourbon or a rum or anything, you know, even if you look at some of the brandies that are being produced. And I do think, you know, and maybe this is kind of, well, we'll talk a little bit when we talk about fermentation, but in order to hold that new oak, it needs weight of spirit. And, you know, I think definitely when we talk about fermentation, that'll be kind of an interesting time to bring in, you know, how you're combating that new oak because it can overwhelm, you know. I think we've all tasted plenty, plenty products where oak has been an issue. Um, I know I have. Uh, won't know name and shame just now, maybe later. <laughs> but, yeah, and I think the one thing that, so when Maggie, um, we first looked at the, the samples, Maggie basically talked us through like what was happening in the production process and everything. It was, it was amazing. And I was just astounded. And I think the one thing that I just loved was about the molasses. And there's just such a beautiful story behind that because, you know, I think you really maybe start thinking that actually molasses could have terroir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, while I was at the distillery, it was 
really important for me to, you know, really work on where molasses was sourced from. And this was like a big labor of love. The way global sugar is traded and brokered is really, really challenging. So it was always a really important thing for me since um, I started to really try and get down to like, what's the best molasses we can get our hands on period. And I had some experience working, you know, I worked in the spice house through college. So I was aware of the spice trade and issues there. Um, you know, in gin, we don't ask about that as much, but I was really aware of it. And so, you know, of course, we're going to looking at a sugar base. What are we looking at? And so over many years of building relationships and trying to find the right way, we found um, my husband and I found this single origin um, Guatemala single mill molasses. And there were really, really incredible programs at the mill for taking care of the workers and food security and education. Um, and it's just really, really amazing company. And, and the fact that, you know, they could have this terroir and yeah, this molasses producer that we work with, um, you know, my husband had grown up in rural Maine where of course you eat a lot of molasses, brown bread and hermit cookies and all these foods that have molasses in it. And he had grown up on this molasses. And I haven't had a hermit cookie for like 20 years. Right, right. <laughs> So he grew up on this molasses and as we were looking and looking and we'd find a farmer, but the volume wasn't right. Or we'd find a place, but we couldn't actually broker it to it to like Massachusetts. Like we finally just called this family and we were like, you know what? Like my husband grew up on your molasses. He's our lead distiller. Where's it from? And they were like, oh, it's like from this really beautiful, amazing place. And so like, that's how we found them is molasses. You know, he'd been eating his whole life. Um, and so, yeah, it just felt really natural. And, and so while I was there, that was really important to me that we were using that um, and trying to spread that message and, and work with those farmers and that mill um, to be able to express that because in the world of global sugar trade, unless it's agricole, that is AOC agricole, uh, it's, it's very rare to actually know where the sugar is from and have it be from a specific place. So Worthy Park is a very rare exception where, they have all their own estate molasses. And so that's something Zan and I always like to geek out about because it's not bought on like the global trade market for, you know, prices. I, so. And I think, we, I guess we don't really know what effect terroir has on the molasses itself because there's not enough examples of single origin or like being able to really trace back where that has come from. Even if you're talking about Demerara and stuff, you know, it's still not specific enough. You know, when we talk terroir, terroir is about a specific area, not. Right, right, right. And, you know, you and I with the wine background, I go to the Douro Valley and I study, you know, this, this hillside is for this and this and this and the different varietals and how they're being utilized and kept in these separate plots so that you can make these wines that you blend together. And I have a dream that that might happen someday in rum if, if that's what's natural. And then if you look at Haiti, you know, who was, you know, absolutely denied access to a lot of, you know, industrial progress, they have these individual plots of individual heirlooms that they're doing individual things of. So, and you know, it's kind of cool. <laughs> yes, you can really taste the difference and the vintage. Uh, and so that's really kind of a cool expression. And, and, you know, and I think maybe now, actually, do you think we should have a little taste of the first rum just to wet everyone? Yeah, up? let's hit up that New England Reserve. So as I mentioned, yeah, that's kind of- questions When they're a little, little, little kind of lubricated. Yeah. So two to eight year old blend, a mix of cooperage. We use all full size barrels. So what you usually- so, For those of you who are on Facebook, we're tasting the New England Reserve at the moment. Sorry, Maggie. Perfect, thank you, thank you. So yeah, um, this is kind of our entry level aged rum expression. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, the art of the blend is something that um, is really important to me. It was very much instilled in me as my time at Germain Robin, you know, bringing balance, bringing harmony, bringing depth, fore palette, mid palette, back palette, does the aroma match the expression? And so getting to play around with this blend is always a pleasure. And I think I love this one because it's got this vanilla hit as it kind of comes through your palette, but then suddenly that just kind of just widens out and you're right, it's that linear kind of quality, but then it widens out and finish and just gives you these lovely spices this really kind of, it's almost like tobacco box 
kind of cigar box. I feel like I'm just putting my nose into, you know, when you open the cigar box, you get that, that lovely smell of cedar wood that's sort of coming through. You and open I think that box of Ashton's and you're just like, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> really nice sort of almost chili pepper green chili padron pepper kind of note coming through and I think with all of the rums from privateer you get this sort of sweet savory thing that yeah. kind of loop loops all the way through it's, it's a really just kind of lovely and the texture is fabulous you get the the roundness of the of the distillate and then the wood that kind of I think it's the wood that holds it through the palate as you go um so there is a question when you say mixed cooperage, what sort of casks and are, are there in the mix? Sorry, thank yeah, you. Yeah, so when we have our used cooperage, it's usually used brandy, used bourbon, or our own used rum casks, so. And actually, as out of interest, are you using American brandy casks? Yes. Mm. Those were sourced for us by Hubert Germain Robin. Um, yeah, so. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> It's nice. It's nice when your former boss can help you out at your new place. And, <laughs> and also kind of that nice continuation through, you know, you bring a, a piece of you into, into something, which is fantastic. And, you know, I think now, Maggie, we kind of got to talk East because, you know, the one thing that I know that you're, you and I firmly believe is that flavor comes from fermentation. Absolutely. 101, it ain't fucking brain surgery. That's where it comes from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you guys use proprietary yeast and slow ferment. And can we sort of talk a little bit about kind of how that affects the spirit? And yeah. For me, when I came to Privateer, it was really important for me to bring, you know, different yeast strains, different combinations and different expressions for different styles of the rum. You know, we want you to know that when you pick up a Navy Yard, it tastes different than a New England Reserve. And and so for me, you know, at the time it was uh, the amber rum, um, you know, we really had these different blends for these different expressions. Um, and so, yeah, blends of yeast and, you know, working to make sure the yeast get along well together. There's quite a bit of chemistry there with the killer yeast toxin and appropriate pHs and different hydration protocols and making sure everyone's happy, but using Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, and using a different blend to create all sorts of different flavors to coax out what you want. We also allowed um, natural yeast to play a role. That was important for me. Uh, it's one of the first changes I made when I got there was, um, you know, not to do a sterile fermentation, but allow natural yeast to be present in the fermentation. Um, and they can give a little bit of that signature that, you know, you might not get everywhere else. And they might not dominate the fermentation, but they give a hint and a character and a nature to it. Um, that's really, really important. And so allowing the natural yeast to kind of kick off and then you inoculate with the yeast blend you wanna use to bring out some of those flavors. In those blends, I would always include, um, you know, at least one wine yeast, uh, cause I just have played around with them a lot. There's a lot of really beautiful flavors there. Um, and then, yeah, bringing that uh, fermentation through about six days. Um, so getting it, getting all the nice delicious alcohol out in the first few days, but then allowing some bacterial conversion to create all that richness and flavor in the last few days. And we see a really intense pH drop that shows that that is happening. And, and that acidity is so important during the distillation for affixing aromas and then also aroma creation through esterification that you get not just in fermentation, not just in distillation, but also in aging. And those organic acidities play a really important role there. Um, we would also stir the tanks. So the yeast was- Are you doing a yeast stirring just to get that textural quality out of the, right. the yeast, yeah. Exactly, and a little, little bit of richness, a little bit of weight, a little bit of character, a little bit of earthiness. For me, there's always a little delicious umami mushroomy forest floor cellar thing. And a lot of that comes from when the yeast begin to break apart and release these umami flavors. It kind of contrasts some of that like, um, you know, sugared, brulee, grapefruit kind of thing that I love on the New England Reserve. It's one of my favorite notes on that. Yeah, grapefruit's super interesting, actually. I think that's, that's totally right. That little bit of hint, and it just comes a little pip on the nose. And, and actually, you know, the one thing I think definitely with all the rums I've tasted from Privateer, they just really love a bit of time in glass, just to open out and just to kind of, I think when you first nose them, you get this 
the, the oak is what dominates the nose, but as you just let them have a little bit of air, like anything, you know, think about decanting a wine. It's the same principle. You give the spirit air because it needs it. And we'll, actually we'll talk when we come to the last two about kind of my, my theories on some of that and what I'm going to try with the last release. But, you know, I think what I love is you're right. And it's, it's that, that textural component you get from a little bit more what we call lees aging sitting on that those dead yeast that just I just love and, and I think you that is allowing probably you to play around with new oak a lot more yeah that batonage is really really key for that and um as your main Robin, you would you would try to get as much lees into the still as you could you know unappealing for me the person crawling in to clean it out after we fire ran it all day but really good for the flavor um, and yeah, that batonage is so, so important. And for us to have the fermenters that would constantly stir it and keep it constantly in suspension, it, it allowed that to create a lot of that flavor without the heavy yeast settling, which can create a lot of mercaptans or stinkier, nastier sulfur notes um, that you might need to rack off of. I see someone says, um, you know, how much does bacteria play a role in privateer fermentations? It plays, it plays a meaningful role, but it is not the core flavor generator. We allow it to be this nice little compl complement and richness. So, you know, in a scotch distillery where they're doing a bacterial rest, ours is definitely longer than that, but certainly nowhere near the 18 day Vivian Wisdom Hamden Estate rest. Um, you know, I guess it's, yeah, it's not just Vivian, it's many people at Hamden have, you know, honored that very, very, very long rest. Um, and no, we do not bring the pH back up. We really like it to crash out. So we like it to stay between three and five. That's where yeast are happy and negative bacteria are not very happy, but positive bacteria can still thrive. So we usually crash out around 3.2 and that's right about the time. We're timing all of this, right? Like we're selecting the proper yeast for the proper length of fermentation to get the proper pH drop so that everything comes to conclusion together at the right ABV, the right pH over the right amount of time. And that's kind of the beauty of putting together a recipe and trialing, bench trialing recipes is getting all those things to culminate at once. So no, there's no need for us to bring the pH back up. And in fact, we like it really low because as you distill, if you think about distillation, you know, you're stirring something while you're simmering it, that could create a lot of oxidative heat damage. And if you have really high acidity, it's a natural sort of preserving for the purity of those aromas. Um, so they don't end up baked or cooked or stewed. And also those lees, the dead yeast you have in there are natural antioxidants. They bind oxygen and keep it from being damaged. So when you have that in the still as well, and you're applying heat and you're agitating it, you're gonna also help to retain that purity of flavor. And actually, you know, that, that distillation on these, which I mean, definitely is a cognac, you know, very much so that's sort of one of the main kind of ways of distilling in cognac. Yes, it can, if it's not controlled, you, you have those burnt aromas, you have these really sort of almost dirty, nasty aromas, but actually when controlled, when moved, just creates so much texture. And I think, you know, especially when you're using a great ferment. And it's really interesting. We'll talk about the other thing I think you've really taken from cognac, which is bringing down the ABV very, very slowly. You know, like, it's so interesting to see your background with those grape spirits just really, really coming through and, and actually working on a non-grape product. <laughs> Yeah, someone asked if I ever use non-Saccharomyces cerevisiae. No, um, there's a lot of misunderstandings here, I feel like. Yeah. Um, we allow wild yeast, so whatever's there to play a role. So when you're looking at Jamaica, Pombe is a very regular apparent wild yeast, sort of like if you're in certain parts of France, like Southern France, Britannomyces is just a regularly occurring wild yeast. This is a big issue in Calvados. Um, but as far as adding yeast to fermentations, there's a lot of misunderstanding here. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is special in that it is a yeast that you can hold, store, rehydrate, and pitch. Other species of yeast, this is not even really a thing. So I hear a lot of debate about, could we add these yeasts? And I'm like, you can't. They, they, they don't hold up in lab conditions for rehydration and repitching. And when you talk to like yeast professionals, they're like, oh, you can't even buy that. It's not even for sale. It's not a thing. So I feel like there's some confusion there. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae is beautifully stable and set up of the thousands and thousands and thousands of varietals you have access to for unending exploration um, to hold, store, propagate, and pitch. So that's really what is standard. 
And I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, there is yeast, even Saccharomyces. I mean, honestly, in wine, I think we're probably more aware of it because there, as you said, Maggie, there's so many different things that in wine it brings out. So you can bring out your tropical notes in a Sauvignon Blanc. You can dial down your tropical notes in a Sauvignon Blanc. You can, you know, change your tannin structures to a degree. You can, you know, there's so many things that yeast can do to bring out different flavors, different acidities, different, you know, pHs, everything. Um, yeast is such an amazing tool. And just within Saccharomyces, you know, <laughs> there's so much there. <laughs> There's well, so yeah. much there, so much Actually, there. Wild yeast just that. Wild yeast are wild yeast. What happens happens, and sometimes it's shit, and sometimes it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So for us, our wild yeast they tend to produce a lot of sulfur notes, which is why we don't do 100% wild, and we do inoculate to kind of allow them to give some character, but then sort of cut them off at the bar when they get a little unruly, and it would actually spoil it. Um, yeah. Um, so we have a couple of other questions here uh, and just you know uh, Maggie Ross is actually making his own rum in Scotland at the moment yeah I've down yet. I've got a lot of packages <laughs> so. yeah we do temperature control during during fermentation um that's kind of for me and my style everything I say is like trying to hit an intended style of the spirit and it doesn't mean it's better or worse than anyone else's everyone has different intentions and different styles that they're trying to hit but for me I ferment between, you know, I would, I set up private chair to ferment between 74 and 78 degrees. Um, it keeps it nice and cool. The yeast aren't too stressed. It can retain a lot of purity of the base ingredient and a lot of the smaller, more delicate mm. perfumed aroma. I really like perfume. I want to be able to smell a glass from here, you know? And so that cool, cool temperature with those light, delicate esters, then I'm not blowing them off really fast in a fast fermentation. Something Don and I learn in the Masters of Wine is the hotter you ferment, the less purity of your base ingredient, which can be great if you're trying to like express something else, like, you know, a really intense, you know, high ester funk, like maybe you don't want it to taste like literal molasses, you want it to taste like steak, you know, and all these other flavors, but I kind of liked retaining a little bit of that purity and that delicacy. It's kind of my style. So not cold, but definitely not a hot fermentation. Cool. <laughs> so should we taste the next? What are we tasting next, Maggie? What's yeah, your... Navy Yard. So talk about New Oak. Um, buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so this is actually a recipe. Um, so my husband, Peter Newsom was the lead distiller at Privateer for eight years. So while you guys all saw me on the road, he was back home making most of the rum. And uh, this is a recipe he came up with. Um, so 100% molasses, single cask, cask strength, aged in a single new American oak barrel with a number three char. And this was sort of a nod to, you know, he and I had both kind of come up in the bourbon world um, and been mentored by some great folks in the bourbon industry, helped at a couple distilleries there. Um, and so this was sort of a, a different nod. So definitely very bold, very like, you could see yourself drinking this in a cabin in Maine, which is yeah. like who he is. So, uh, um, so yeah, it's got a lot of richness of oak, um, but hopefully the richness of the flavor as well and trying to bring it in balance. Yeah. This is where I think that least stirring is super helping because you're getting, and it is really, really funny. I had a lovely gentleman that sells me popcorn. I mean, you would have thought that someone sells me popcorn and he emailed me today saying, I've just read on one of your things that you taste buttered popcorn. Is that a thing? And I was like, it's not like a marketing tool. <laughs> Just like sometimes you use this buttered popcorn thing. And I get that on this. When I stick my nose straight in it, I get this really lovely buttery popcorn. And for me, that's a real kind of, in wine, I would think about that as lee stirring. And that's where that kind of lovely creaminess, it's a creaminess to this. Yeah, this. like a custardy, browned yeah. butter, bacony, brown sugary thing. Yeah. And I think you definitely get that. I mean, that lovely, this is where I get that cherry wood character that I always find on American bourbons and American whiskeys. It's some, something for me that I very much associate probably with new oak in America, cherry kind of cherry wood and yeah, sort of nutmeg and all spice and all of that good stuff. Uh, yeah. Very forward, it's very firm, it's very linear. Hopefully the heat of the cast strength 
accelerates the flavor on the palate so it can stand up to that oakiness. And, and actually, Maggie, I, I want to ask a question here. I was going to bring in on the um, thicker sleeves, but I'll ask here because I think this is maybe one that needs a little bit of time resting in bottle. Yeah, yeah. Just to let that new oak sink into the, the spirit a little bit, just to kind of, because I know this is going to get better in glass. No. Yeah, I uh, totally. I, I know a distillery in Florida who does great work and they bottle rest for a month before they go to market. It's just like wine, you know, it's just in a different pace, but the same chemistry. Um, and yeah, I definitely find bottle rest. Like for me, if I move, like if I, if I take a bottle on a trip, like I want to not actually have to give it to that person for a day or two. Like I'm very careful about this stuff. Um, but yeah, that bottle rest, that integration, that mellowing, because yeah, there's all sorts of chemical upheaval and tumult as we would call it sort of in the cognac sort of American brandy world, this tumult it goes through. Um, you want to give it a moment to kind of find its peace. And that one, you know, being pot stilled is so beefy and, and bold and yeah, having that richness. So and it definitely has that umami that you were talking about before. I think I get a little porcini mushroom on this one for sure. You know, it's just, it's just like cooking in there. And you know, think about it. When you get on an airplane, you have jet lag. It's the same stuff. You know, I think it, it's it's something you have to keep in your head. Those bottles get jet lagged in their own. Yeah. <laughs> I we got a lot. What is your favorite rum to drink, privateer or otherwise? Well. <sighs> might go on for some time I mean, yeah. <laughs> right it's like it's there's so many beautiful rums out there period um I would say the two I probably reach for the most like there's always times where I want to like have a little treat and visit a little friend in a bottle but I would say the two I reach for the most are probably whatever I happen to have from Trudian at Mount Gay um, and Worthy Park, those are probably the two I kind of reach for the most. I really think what Worthy Park is doing is it's really brilliant. It's really smart. They've got that gorgeous foresight. Um, you know, it's got, it embodies the Jamaican funk, but it's doing its own thing. It's not trying to replicate mm. the, the big bad houses. You know, it's, it's got this really lovely, like, I mean, I, I love, all those producers, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, but it has this like elegance to it that just speaks to me personally. And I think the fact that like, you know, they really ramped up that distilling operations yeah. around the time of like the rebirth of American craft distilling. I feel like there's like Synergy. that spirit of like wanting to like honor history and be their own thing without being gimmicky at all, like being very classy. Like, I feel like it's, I feel like it's a really special and I, I just really, really love the palette. Spirit. It's, you know, I think I could probably blind taste Worthy Park, you know, like, yep. bam. Of They're anyone, not, of yeah. anyone, I'm like, I know this is Worthy Park. Yeah. Yep. I'm happy. I'm in my happy zone. Zan, if you're watching, do you love me and Maggie? <laughs> <laughs> and I know you know Gordon, who's just like the sweetest human on the face of the earth. So I, I, th I think it's, you know, I understand he's got a big company to run, but I'm also like, everyone should know you. You're the greatest. <laughs> he's so kind. Um, and then someone asked about uh, entry proof. So we go into barrel pretty low. So 110 US proof, so that's 55% ABV. So typically a bourbon would be going in around 125 proof. So the higher the alcohol, the more extractive it is and the more oak it's gonna pull and the more aggressive it's gonna be. So we go in at a much lower proof. And that's something I brought to the company right when I started where I really like that lower proof. I really like that gentler pull. It takes more time to get the oak to integrate but it integrates more evenly. Um, and then also you'll notice on our ages, a big part is how you're distilling it and making cuts to pair it to that barrel so that by the time you're ready to pull it out, it's where it needs to be. And we actually changed you know, I will always change the way I distill a spirit based on if it's going to be aged shorter or longer. And I think, you know, you say it needs longer aging, but and we'll talk about this a bit later, but like what I thought was amazing is how much these rums change. And I got to taste rums literally in the same type of cast from the same, everything was the same, except it was just one month difference. And I was like, yeah. are we talk about which side of the warehouse it was on? Like it was on the sunrise <laughs> or the sunset side? I loved it. <laughs> 
And this is why I talk about terroir of the cellar, because if you were in a field of grapes, you would understand that the side where the sun rose would get the most sun and warm up first, and it would stay warm all day, whereas the other side would not get direct sun. It wouldn't really warm up until midday, and like the grapes would ripen differently. So when you have casks in a cellar at such a northerly extreme like us, where the sun is intense, you know, in the summer, it seems like it's always daylight out. And in the winter, like you guys, it's like dark all the time. So being on one side of the warehouse makes a barrel taste totally different than if it's on another because of the way it's warming up and how it's going through the day and it's season. So and you know, I, I love being able to share that with you. So cool. And you know, I had an amazing chat. And actually it was Maggie's, um, that tasting we did that made me do a, a, a talk on um, terroir of the cellar at whiskey show and we did an amazing talk with Drew Mayville, um, Patrice from Con uh, uh, Frappan and Cognac and Ian Chang from Cav well, ex-Cavalan and it, you know just talking about that I mean anyone who's ever visited Cavalan will understand when you stand in that warehouse and you are literally dripping with sweat and you're only on the first floor and there's eight stories <laughs> you know, like, that is happening to the barrel <laughs> not just you I think it's super interesting that sort of the, that cellar terroir conversation and something I want to do more and more and more with because I think it's super fascinating, super fascinating. Um, so Michael's asked, how long does bottle rest continue affect, to affect rum for? Will rum change significantly in an unopened bottle over the course of months or years? So I think it's probably a non-scientific answer from my side I could answer I mean Maggie will probably give you a scientific answer so let's go for Maggie <laughs> I don't know that I'll give you much of a scientific answer if you want to go first so I mean like for me it's it's about look when you have a bottle no matter what there is air in that bottle eulage yeah you never have anything right to the top so and, and I, I understand it's probably more from a wine perspective because in wine it affects it much more rapidly you know even though when I say rapidly it's still over a long ass period of time but that little bit of air is just definitely going to affect and it, it definitely affects it differently in spirits and wine because that ABV is already protecting the spirit hence why you can actually have spirits open for a lot longer than you would have a bottle of wine of course um you know in wine it's oxidizing the tannins it's oxidizing the alcohol you know, but that you know we talk we don't talk a lot about we talk a lot about wood aging. We don't talk a lot about how oxygen affects the alcohols, which for me is the really, really interesting point. Uh, you know, wood's easy, you know, how it affects the alcohols is really, really interesting. And, you know, I think it's it's a slow process, but I definitely know that I, I think the thing that brought it to my attention the most, um, we released, we had a Patron, we, we did a single cask with Patron tequila. And when we, when we picked the cask, it was beautiful, it was bright. It was an Añejo. I don't even like Añejo tequila because normally I find the wood too dominant. But they, they gave us this really, this cask that was insanely good. And we were like, oh my God, oh my God, yeah, we'll go for it. But by the time they bottled it, it was months after we tasted it. And you know, as Maggie knows, a lot happens in a couple of months. Um, and so we got it and I was like, oh my God, this is horrible. This is horrible. I was like, how the hell? And actually, it was quite a good thing that COVID happened for that bottle because I would have sent it back. But because COVID happened, everyone on furlough, I couldn't send it back to anyone. <laughs> so it just sat there and I forgot about it. And then about six months later, we tasted it. And I was like, this is so good. And it just had a, that time span had just allowed that wood that was dominating just to mellow out a little bit and soften and, and actually instead of giving tannin it was giving sweetness mm -hmm. yeah oxidizing those tannins out integrating the alcohol because alcohol is going to accelerate tannin on the palate um and yeah the al alcohol agitation is you know nothing to be messed with like when I'm handling spirits in preparation for a bottle, it is gentle, 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 gentle. If it were up to me, it'd be a fully gravity fed distillery, which is totally gentle care. Cause if you agitate the spirit in any way, it's gonna get really excited and really aggressive. Um, and you're also gonna lose some of your delicate flavor molecules to excitement. Um, but you're right, that little bit of oxygen and time can give that little bit of degradation of the edge to that tannin, a little bit of, yeah, integration. Um, and my suggestions are always, you know, keep it out of 
light as much as you can. That always helps. Um, and then, you know, once you open it, then you're going to start to see pretty serious effects. Um, you know, for me, we like to, you know, I always like to rest um, my spirits uh, before. So it's like, take it out of the cask, rest, put it in the bottle, rest, like resting each step. Um, sometimes if I open a bottle and it's pretty harsh and aggressive and I set it aside and I come back and it's much smoother, I know that it probably was like harvest proof to bottle filter, duh, like it just went through a lot really fast and it needed to calm down. Um, and then sometimes if I'm tasting a bottle and as I drink it, I notice it's getting better and better with oxygen. It kind of tells me maybe it should have been matured a little longer. It had a little more to give. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think for both Don and I in quality assessment, especially in masters of wine, you know, being able to smell the glass and smell that the flavors evolving in the glass is such an indicator for quality for me. Yeah. If it's, oh, it's static in the glass, it can be good, but it can never be great. Yeah. It has to be evolving in the glass. And I think Richard Seal at Foursquare is a master of this evolution in the glass. Yeah. And so are you, Maggie. Mm -hmm. But should we taste, should we taste the next? So Let's do some queen share. Queen share. This I'm is gonna do it up. Sly is there. <laughs> Sly, are you there? <laughs> Like talking to a ghost, Sly, Sly, are you there? I see yeah, you. There. I see you. I'm there, yes. What, what, why, have you, why have you highlighted me? Because there. I'm the only one who doesn't have this in on the chat. Thank, thanks. Shall I send you, send you, send you the rest of I'm, my bottle? I'm scratching the screen. <laughs> Sly, I am trying to find you some, don't worry. I know. I know you got my back, Dawn. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So Maggie, Queen Cher, the elusive to Sly bottle. <laughs> yes, Queen Cher. So um, traditional distillation method where you kind of collect this very flavorful cut at the end of the distillation. You regather it again and again and again, and then finally do a redistillation of it together. Um, and so what you end up with is this very heavy, very rich, very flavorful uh, spirit. And to me, it always has like much more tropical notes to it, much more macadamia nut, much more like pineapple marmalade than any of our other expressions. And it has this really awesome menthol note to it. Like yes. it's got this really beautiful cooling character, but then again, it's that green chili. It's got a lovely heat but it's not an alcohol heat it's a spice heat which I just think and I can see why Sly is really desperate to get his hands on this because it's just delicious I mean I wish I could bring it to you honey <laughs> soon <laughs> you'll be back here soon but you know I think it's such a delicious a, well, it's, it's just it ha, it just explodes with flavor and I think again it's really just amazing just to have that richness and that power yeah so someone is asking if my faints rerun use the same parameters. It's not technically faints. They're called seconds, so they're slightly different. It would be like the first collection of the faints. Um, and then at a certain point, you would just let the faints become the faints because you wouldn't have any good alcohol left in it. So imagine it's like the first nugget of the faints. We would put that in the still, dilute it to a properly safe ABV, and then when you distill that, it distills totally different. The temperature is going to be different. It's just, it's going to be very volatile, come over very quickly. It's going to be lower temperatures with a lot more activity. And you really need, it takes a real deft hand to kind of technically rein that in and get the separation you want between the remaining long chain, super heavy, heart rich ethanol and those sort of faints that are lingering in there to get that separation of such a volatile, like everything wants to fly out of the still and you really got to cut it apart. And then as soon as you taste any faints at all throughout your collection, boom, cut down the still, you're done. You've got all you can get because it'll turn fainty very, very fast. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a totally different distillation technique, different timing and different style for sure. So Dan's asking how Queen Share has developed over time. Yeah, so the very first bottle we put out is still to this day, like just my absolute favorite. Um, again, that's kind of one of those sort of untold stories where Peter, uh, my husband, the lead distiller, it was, uh, there was kind of a feeling at Privateer that it should continue to be used as a blending component in the, you know, what is now the New England Reserve. And he 
really was like, you know what? I make this, I make this all the time. I love it. I think it's great. It should be its own product. I really want to put my foot down and like save a couple barrels to release it. I think it's worth it. If we, I know we want more volume on this, but if we stop and we save this and age it a little longer, it could be worth so much more. Um, and that first barrel is like still to this day, really incredible. Um, and then because Queen Share is such a distinct style of distillation, every single barrel truly does taste really different. So back in the day, we would release whatever. It could be fourth use oak, it could be used bourbon, it could be used whatever. So every Queen Share was really, really, really different. We kind of found that that was not pleasing to people at that time. If you think about, you know, what, 2013, it was a different time in the rum world and weirdo single cask, you know, cask strength. Bottlings for collectors was not really that much of a thing the way it is, especially in the U.S. market that it is now. Um, and so we kind of reined it back uh, to the queen share coming out is either new oak or once used our own rum casks. So to kind of tighten up that style. So that's why the old ones can be all over the board. They're all about expressing something really wild and really different. And now it's more about this is the flavor and this is what people can expect from it. And I mean, I just can't get over it. Do you know what I feel like? I feel like it's Christmas and I'm licking a peppermint candy cake. <laughs> Yeah, I always say it's like that menthol liptus. Like it almost has like a you're in the koala house eucalyptus y thing. Yeah, yeah. It's super funny. I just have this, and then I have cinnamon roll in my head as well. <laughs> but you know, and, and we were talking like when we, we we first kind of did our sort of tasting together, we were talking about marks and you know, are you doing sort of certain marks and how you, you know, what are your marks? And, and you know how are you kind of developing a New England style in terms of you know, your own identity of the different distillates and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Because in you know my, all of my whiskey training and all of my cognac style training, like that's nothing you ever did. You use the same still, same recipe, made it the same way, it went to the same barrel. And you know brandy, cognac style spirits, you use different grapes from different plots, from different wines, but you distill it exactly the same way. It usually goes into the barrel regime the same way, um, goes into the shea the same way, and like that's just how it is. And then in rum, it's we ferment this different and we distill it different. And you walk into a distillery. I I just had to explain this the other day. You walk into a distillery and there's four or five different stills. And you would never see that in a whiskey distillery. It would be clone, 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 you know? You go to Patron, it's clone, 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 clone stills. Um, and you have all these different stills and they create these bl different blending ingredients and you have different casks that you maintain and you bring together for different expressions. And yeah, it's all 100% molasses maybe if, at certain distilleries and like, but it, it makes all these different expressions because of these choices. And so that for me was something really amazing about rum I'll always carry with me in my career. and you know, being able to say like, okay, well, this is our, you know, rich, fine, rich, thick, uh, Yankee thick, and kind of creating our own names for our own different yeast blends, our own different fermentations, our own different uh, distillations, and kind of creating these coded names and just trying to, you know, do it naturally and let it kind of grow and become its own thing rather than trying to like force it and create like a protocol. So we kind of had these different things. And then one day we were like, okay, we have all these different things. Let's like name them and organize them. <laughs> So. I mean, I love it because when you sent me the samples, it was like Yankee. I was like, what is this Yankee thing? I mean, I know what Yankees are, but <laughs> they're a baseball team. What are you talking about? <laughs> right, right, right. And the Yankee is the mark with that singed grapefruity note. So. Oh, Pete's asking about the age statement on Queen Share. Um, on the exact cask you have, uh, I don't have the text sheet in front of me. It's usually like two to three years, usually three and a half, actually, these days. Yeah, yeah. Pete Allen says yes. If I, if I try and go into my email to find the text sheet, I will blow up the place. Billy, I'm, I'm like, I'll destroy this if I... Right now, I can, I can feel Billy searching wildly for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, should we, we've got to do, we've got on the New England bottled and bond, haven't Let's we? Let's do the bottled and bond. So you'll notice this is like a different step in proof and style from the Queen Share. So I'm taking a little risk having you guys taste it after. Um, so it's a hundred proof. So bottled and bond is like a very distinct, um, you know, a, a United States designation. Um, and it's been really fun for me to introduce into the rum world because bottled and bond is not something that exists in any other country. So bottled and bond had this long history, um, you know, before prohibition bartenders really didn't like spending money on bottled products that claimed to be something that it wasn't. 
And so they really, really pushed for a couple legal designations, one being straight, which guaranteed the aging. Um, and we released a number of straight rums and then bottled and bond. So bottled and bond by law has to be fermented, distilled, aged and bottled on a federally bonded premises, which our distillery is. It has to be made by one distillery in one distilling season. It has to be aged four years um, in oak and then be bottled at 100 proof, so 50% ABV strength. So it has to be sort of guaranteed to actually be handcrafted by the people who made it. Um, we were really excited to kind of release this. It was the first bottled and bond rum released um, since before prohibition. We sent in the application to the federal government for the label and they were like, uh, we kind of need proof this product exists because uh, they didn't have any paperwork for it. So we found an amazing spirits collector who had old bottles, old photos, old advertisements of bottled and bond rum and we got it approved and we got it through. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of, it was exciting to revive that Queen Share label and exciting to revive the bottled and bond label um, and just kind of bring that in. So I, I really find that this, this distillery shows really well at 100 proof. It's this kind of like one of my beloved cinnamon spirits. roll. Like I thought Queen Share was cinnamon roll, but I'm just like, I could eat this right now. Like I could eat And it. it's 100% new oak and you would not know it. No, and it's just holding it so well. Like the oak's there, I know it's oak, but I'm just like, I could eat this right now. Like who needs dinner? We're staying here till 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> like steak rum, you know? <laughs> And just super delicious. And, you know, I think it's, and I, you know, that tradition we're very familiar with, those of you who are, are whiskey people and you see bourbons and stuff, we're very, bottled and bond is such a common term to see on labels um, when it comes to bourbons. And, you know, it's so nice to kind of bring that tradition into rum, because as you say, it's a very kind of, it, it gives you a quality level or the degree of craftsmanship. And, knowledge of what's going on in in the bottle and i think the really interesting thing is that you know we've talked a lot about and the the industry talks a lot about is transparency and that you know it gives you a, a degree of confidence in what's going on in the bottle for sure mm. honestly maggie no, no. Yeah, and that was extra fun for me because one of my good friends she released a george dickel bottled in bond the same year um, and so it was kind of like, we got to be like little twinning, like having a good time, doing fun. I just saw a memory today of us wearing matching sweaters at a distiller's convention. Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> to celebrate our bottled and bond releases. <laughs> Hers was a little bit more serious than mine, um, but yeah, it was great. <laughs> and yeah, you know, Pete, you're absolutely right. The mouth feels so, it's so, it's almost velvety. It's, it's kind of like yum, 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 yum in my palate. It's just, it's delicious. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm loving it. Absolutely loving it. And it's funny because what's interesting is I opened these bottles um, probably a week, no, a couple of weeks ago to get the, to just taste through to see what kind of order to put them in. And of course I was like wrong. And actually what's quite nice is how much they developed just with that little bit of air coming in them. Mm -hmm. And like now I'm, like, they're just singing, they've, they've changed so much, you know, it, it's so, so exciting to, to taste them. So Maggie. Let's do it, sisters in arms. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> so I think this was probably my most exciting day of 20 bar, maybe black top days, which maybe wasn't so exciting, but it was memorable. Uh, but uh, this was definitely probably one of my most memorable days in 2020 when um, it was Maggie, myself and Mitch, uh, those of you who know Mitch from Black Top, um, there was like no one in the office because it was the beginning of COVID. It was just Mitch, I and Maggie on- Some flamingos, and some palm trees. I mean, it, it went downhill pretty quickly after we finished the season runs. <laughs> but I just, remember just being so shocked by these these samples and how different they were and you know we were tasting through them and what was interesting is when Maggie asked me what I wanted I was like can I explain to you in like wine flavor terms I was like I kind of want it to be like a Viognier <laughs> and like Maggie thank god knew what I meant <laughs> I was like I will be selecting all of these samples thank you 
<laughs> and and I said in the beginning that I only wanted I didn't want new oak because you know like normally when Sakina and I taste um, anything that's sort of been in a lot of new oak we're a bit you know in whiskey it really unless it's a bourbon yeah you struggle with it and Maggie's like no I'm just gonna send you some new oak ones anyway I said hey fine uh, doing I, it anyway <laughs> so I totally expected to just love the the you know the the, the ex rum casks and I remember tasting well we'll taste well we taste the stern arms first I think for yeah. me uh, and for those of you that have the um thicker sleeves you are the only people in the UK in the world to taste these this product right now because the only people that taste this myself Maggie, Mitch, and Sakinda, and Billy. <laughs> so you're all really very, very lucky. And what I would say with Thick of Sea is this is the one I want to leave a lot longer in bottle because I just want it to just really ping. And I think it will just with a little bit more, little bit more time in bottle. So sister in arms, tell us about it, Maggie. <laughs> Uh, well, when I tasted it with you, I think I was really excited. It showed really well that day, which is always like a concern, right? You're always like, is it even showing well this day? Um, it was showing really, really well. And I just kind of loved that it spoke to some of the things that I think we are both really excited about. You know, I kind of get teased at the distillery for it being like prancy, but they're like, you know, Peter's very rustic and earthy. And I'm very like, this is, this is a beret in, a, in rum form. So the fact that you wanted something that had this viognier -y kind of apricot, um, marmalade, richness, with also like a little bit, what I love about viognier is this phenolic grip to kind of cut through that richness so that it stays fresh and intriguing and kind of vibrates across the palate and almost and makes you want to take that spice, next sip. You know, that ginger spice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and it has that that confident kind of presence across the palate. This is a broader one, yeah. It sits very back palate, very confident. So what about you? What are your thoughts? You're the real taster no chance Maggie your palate is much better than mine I mean I just love it and it, it's funny because I went back to the original sample because what we do is we always keep the original sample of whatever we taste and then compare it to to the the, the sample we have now and or the, the final sample because the one thing that we were really really like as soon as we decided on it I said to Maggie can you get it out of class now I don't want it to change um, and I just knew from actually doing these tastings with Maggie, like how quickly even a month could make a, a difference on. And it is different from the first sample because we did probably take it just under a month to probably come back and forth and, you know, get pricing and everything, blah, blah. And I think I almost love this more now. Good, good, good. And it is, you know, it has that little bit of orchard fruits that sort of for me it's almost like a dried apricot um it's got a little bit of that banana but it's dried banana it's mm. texturally I love it it's just it's as Maggie said it's got that breadth on the palate which I don't think any of the others do when I'm tasting through the range now this is just it ma it's mouth coating, and that's what Viognier does. Viognier is very textural. It's, it's, it's a very sexy grape, Viognier, yeah. for me. And I think this is a sexy rum, you know? <laughs> me and Maggie, super sexy. <laughs> very voluptuous and luscious. <laughs> My MW, like fancy terms. MW. Yeah. I think there's just this lovely spice on it. I just think it's got this beautiful little hint of vanilla. It's I just want to drink it. it. It's such a drinkable rum, but I just really think it's got this amazingly long length on the palate. I'm still tasting it. Yeah. You know, it it's not going away. So I, I'm really excited by this one. I'm actually, like, I know I have a bottle here, but now I'm like, I should have bought myself another bottle so I can have one to keep. 
Sly, Sly, can I have your bottle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that face. And actually, Billy's put a, a nice comment, and, and someone asked me earlier, and I should just say, because it was a great question. Um, someone asked earlier, they were like, okay, if I'm new to rum, how should I drink it? And I thought that that's a great question. Um, wait, and I wait do Dawn, Dawn, can I just interrupt you really quickly? Can we just talk about how you sent me on a fetch quest? <laughs> how you sent me on a fetch quest and made me drive down to London Bridge Whiskey Exchange because you told me there might be some uh, queen share there and how there wasn't any there when I got there. <laughs> can we talk about that? But how I still managed to spend 200 pounds on rum that I didn't actually need or want. Well, I, obviously I wanted it. I want all the rum. <laughs> smart, very smart move, Dawn. Very, Sorry. that's why you get the big box. <laughs> Sly, right, I love I'm, I'm gone. I love you. <laughs> but, you know, now I've totally distracted myself. So I think when you're tasting anything, I would always suggest taste it neat first. Even if you, you think, oh my God, that's a really high ABV, you know, sometimes I say to just people put a little drop on your, because it's getting your palate used to tasting and especially at a high ABV. So put your, you know, if you're a bit worried, just put your finger into the glass, dip it in your nose, just so you can get used to the flavors and get the real sense of the flavors and then take a little bit at a time. Just don't take a whole gulp, but just try it neat first. And then if it's too much, absolutely drop a little bit of water in. If you want to drink it on ice, drink it on ice. If you want to put some Coke in it, just put some Coke in it, Coca-Cola, folks. Um, not sure I'd recommend the other Coke with rum. Don't know, that's you. Um, but, you know, I think it's just, it, it's about what, how you want to drink it is super important. Pep Pepsi for life. I'm like, I'm giving Billy snaps. <laughs> Are you hilarious, you're hilarious. Pepsi, not Coca-Cola? Oh, I'm a Coca-Cola person. Like there's like three days a year where I walk into the distillery with an ice cold Coca-Cola first thing in the morning and they know. <laughs> Maggie is tired. Maggie is grumpy. Hold She's on. having a breakfast Coca-Cola. <laughs> My staff know if it's a Diet Coke day, leave her alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I totally, I was uh, teasing Richard about how at our events, you know, we work all day and then we have a sit down dinner at night and sort of between the event and right before dinner, while everyone else is arriving, because he and I are always early, we sit down and I have a Coca-Cola and he has a Diet Coke and we just talk about the day. And I'm like, that is what I miss most right now. Yeah. I, I don't miss- Drinking soda. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, honestly, like a Marmite toasty, cheese and Marmite toasties. If I'm hungover, done. Uh, <laughs> no pineapple, Caroline, not acceptable pineapple on pizza. We're not going down that road. Can we? Can we remove Caroline from the uh, from the Zoom, please? Thank you very much. <laughs> and Billy is not allowed more sugar. Let's just like, knock all this off in one go. <laughs> oh God. <Excellent>. No. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's going downhill rapidly. People are obviously drinking. <laughs> so on that note, should we hit thick as thieves? Yes, 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 and, yes, yes. And I think what I love probably most about this project is the names. <laughs> I had so much fun. These names were so easy. Sometimes names for people are really hard, but we were quick. We were very quick. And it was literally like, bam, 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 bam. We were like, and we were all like, that's perfect. That's perfect. You know, got it done got it done and I think it, it sister in arms came first and then thick as these came straight after it was literally like one email <laughs> boom, boom. very very easy and very 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 true and there's video to prove it so oh, yeah <laughs> luckily I did not save the, the zoom call when we were tasting these rums because it did did kind of descend into slight chaos where Mitch and I were hiding behind a plant and crawling along the floor. I don't, I, we, I don't remember being drunk. <laughs> I don't think we were drunk. I think we were just delirious. I have some screenshots, don't worry. Um, I see a question from Meredith about who distilled Sisters in Arms and thick, thick as Thieves. And you know what, Meredith, you might have to email Dylan at privateerrum.com. I don't know if that's on the tech sheet. 
I will I think it is. Billy, do you have a tech sheet? Does it say that? I'm like, Billy, Billy's on it. Don't worry. Billy's, he's like, I'm not working. I'm like, go to work, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Billy knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I love the fact that we've got the most random food pairings here or food combos. All of you are totally wrong, so I'm not even going to entertain any of these. I, I have a palate for God's sakes, people. <laughs> so it's thick as Okay, so, so info. sorry guys. Sorry, there's Meredith. There's distiller info, but Meredith, if you want to do Dylan at privateerrum.com and ask him to look it up for you, he will in a heartbeat. So as thick as these, and this is the one that I want to rest. And I probably won't release this until rum show. Ba -ba 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 -ba. That will be July around Black Tot Day. No, I'm not doing 72 hours straight. It's not going to happen. Um, so it'll probably be around rum show. I'll probably offer it out to any of those that are coming on to rum show um, first. So it'll be a bit of a show exclusive because I do think giving it about sort of six months is just going to make it awesome. It's going to be awesome. So, but saying that, it's still pretty damn awesome. And this was the one that I think, I think Sister in Arms was the one I knew I was going to like because it's ex rum cask, la, la la This is the new American Oak Feast. And this is three years and one month. Mm -hmm. uh, where if you look at Sister in Arms, that's three years. Yeah, flat. I, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> different marks, different expressions. Yeah. So, I mean, and I think when we were tasting this, this is the one I think Maggie laughed the most at our reaction on because we were like, and I, I was trying to keep Dawn poker face, which those of you who know me, that, that there's no poker face. It, it is what You're it a is. very professional buyer lady. And you were like, yes, this is interesting. What are the specs? <laughs> no, I wasn't. Mm. <laughs> and thank God, this is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I think you two were doing like a, almost like a flamingo head thing where you were like, about this one. <laughs> and actually, this is the one that I remember turning around to Maggie and going, this is smoky bacon. This has got this sort of saltiness to it. And it's smoky to it, which I just like, you know, I think if you like a little bit of a peated whiskey or something like that, and which I, and I'll be really, really interested if any of the whiskey people get to try this because all the rum guys are going to go after it, how that's going to be taken up because it's so different. But yet, it's still privateer. Thanks. And, and I think that was the, the, the question. The first four, oh, Pete's got a question. The first four have been single blended, the single cast or traditional column question, observation, not sure. I don't know what the question is. Are you asking? Traditional distillation method is pot and single and column distillation. So that's like run of the mill. So we, uh, Pete, you know, I'm trying to kind of help sort of this this classification system so we're now asking for that to be on all our bottles anytime we do a rum so you know it's super know it's, yeah it should be on the tech sheet i guess yeah I don't I know mean, it's um you know so we decided we really wanted to kind of follow that so you know it, we're trying to create a language and and that language is super important to kind of how yes. we want to talk about product i remember when that article came out and i was like this is amazing this is incredible and I sent it to everyone at work I don't know that we had met yet by then in person and I was very very into it I was like American Craft Spirits Association look uh, <laughs> it was good um, but yeah we're all batch distillation nothing continuous so I think that addresses a lot yeah sorry so 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 not a typo different distillations oh, what on the two single casks yeah if it's on there that's exactly what they are I think one is a. Uh, They're both single traditional. 
column. Sorry, single traditional column. I was just like the single traditional, single traditional column. <laughs> yeah, they're both exactly. I was like, hold on a minute. Then we've written something wrong on the label, but that's not worry about. It. <laughs> <laughs> Have you considered posting distillery facts on TW sites, terroir stills? Etc. So um, we have an amazing editorial team and they have a head of that work, but we are trying every time we do a new product, we do more, we're trying to put more and more information on that product. With rum, we're really clear about whether it is um, how the distillation is. Oh, hello, George's cat. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, Maggie and I are totally distracted by a cat. Yeah. And Billy, if you have the tech sheet, it should say how it's distilled on the tech sheet. And we do have different types of distillation. It's all batch, but we can do batch double pot, batch pot column, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, both of the uh, both the single cast are uh, first distillation batch pot still, second distillation batch single column. So, it, again, there, there's some work to do. I feel in our classification. It's hard, you know, I think when you're looking at a classification, you can't do every variant, it's impossible, and also it would confuse the general consumer, and you've always got to think, you know, you guys sitting here today are 1% of the consumer, 1%. I have to talk to 99% of the consumer, so, you know, I also have to buy for 99% of the consumer, um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's super important. Um. Sorry. It's a little higher, Tom. Oh. Yeah, look at that. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Want to see the baby? Thank oh, you. <laughs> I, was I can't see it. Oh, hello. George, Tom, I like this. This is good. Sorry, guys. We're distracted. <laughs> Maggie and I. Are you making everyone shoot their cats? It's fine. <laughs> My cats. Um, if I could get spaghetti out here, I would, but. Oh, and I, I'm not at home, so I can't get Percy. <laughs> Twins. Maggie and I have the same cat. The same yeah. cat. It's like That's, creepy. It's very it creepy. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I think it's really important to understand that when you're when you're looking at a classification system, and, and I, I know Maggie will agree with me, is that you have to be able to make it accessible for a consumer. We are not typical consumers. Um, hence why what we did is um, what we were layering in is all around distillation techniques um, around the base product that it's made from. And then we also layered in flavor camps, which probably for me is the most key thing and something we're going to take through into tequila mezcal. If I ever get time to do that this next couple of months, I also going to do it for wine and we're also going to do it probably for gin. So, you know, I think that's, it, it's really important. Um, <laughs> Pete, I want thick as thieves. I know, so do I. I actually might buy a bottle for myself this time. Because <laughs> I think it's looking super awesome. But uh, yeah, so I mean, does anyone, actually one thing Maggie, I do definitely want to talk about is that, you know, when I was kind of brushing up on my privateer uh, knowledge, I suddenly remembered when I was looking at it that you actually bring down the alcohol very slowly, which is a really classic cognac technique. And, and I always, it makes sense to me because, and, and actually I was talking to, I don't remember who it was. I think it was maybe Patrice from Frappa. And he was saying, we bring down it very, very slowly because you shock the spirit too much if you just whack water in. Yeah, it, there's a couple things that go on. And, you know, in, in distilling, you know, we didn't have the chemistry for fermentation until, you know, honestly recently. So, a lot of it is like just gut, you've done it a thousand times and you know it to be true, even if we don't necessarily have all the like, oh, it's hydrolysis, da 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 da. So bear with me. But uh, when you, so basically, when you're adding water to a spirit, you have, um, there's so many options, it's unbelievable and how to do this. But, you know, we like to, I like to bring it down very slowly and in steps with small amounts. Um, and if it's something like our first distilled in a pot, pot still, second distillation in a single column still, um, I'm fine adding the water and then hand stirring it and having that be that. So you add it 
you add a little bit of water, so you get more volume, the alcohol strength goes down, you let it rest, you do it again, you let it rest, you do it again, you let it rest. And the idea there is if you strike it really fast, you're going to, you know, throw the alcohol into tumult, it's going to be hard and aggressive and be less integrated. You're gonna heavily dilute the flavor and you also risk soponification. So if you ever get a spirit and it kind of smells like that pink hand soap, you know, when you go to a nice restaurant and use that pink hand soap and then everything you eat, your hands smell awful and it ruins your meal. It's that same pink hand soap smell. You'll get that like a little hint of that in certain whiskeys and certain brandies and certain rums if it's been proofed really aggressively. And this has to do with the oils and separation, et cetera. Um, there's all sorts of really wild things going on when you add water to spirit. If you add one gallon of water to one gallon of spirit, you actually don't end up with two gallons because of the way the molecules click together. They also release a significant amount of heat when they interact for the first time. So you're getting a little bit of evaporation. Um, there's a lot going on when you're adding water to spirit. Um, you can get a lot of cloudiness. It can cause certain issues with flocculation. That's a little more complicated. There's a lot more going on there than meets the eye. This is only one element of it. I'm not saying you could fix flocculation necessarily by proofing a certain way, but it does have an effect. Uh, flocculation for people who don't know, it's sort of when these sort of pillowy, cloudy, oily separations happen in bottles of long age spirits that had high strength, usually high strength alcohol pulling hard on oak. So a lot of suspension from that. And then you drop the proof and the suspension is no longer solvent in the liquid. Um, and yeah, so for us, we do those nice little slow steps to just more harmonious, more integration, avoid saponification. When we did, um, you know, um, Tres Aromatique, which is a double pot stilled um, unaged white rum, we used a really traditional cognac method where you actually pre-measure the water, dribble it in, and you, like, there's a very particular method for slapping the surface of the water as the water drips in, so every drop of water for proofing, like, like, 100 gallons was done that way, trickled in minutes, while the surface is slapped. Months to dilute down, like, months, and, and some of them will age their water in the, in barrel, you know, because what they're saying is that by adding the water, you're shocking the liquid. And yeah, so, in the New England Reserve, um, there's a process where when we build the blend, we go through, I collect all the barrels, I add barrels of barrel aged water and bring the proof down. And then I put those in finishing casks, so neutral casks to sit and marry and mix and mingle in. And then the very final proof is done by just uh, reverse osmosis water addition. So we're talking about proofing over six months. In yeah. cognac, you might be proofing over 20 years because you're pulling out a lot, blending it, dropping the proof with barrel aged water ever so slightly, and then re barreling it and then revisiting it the next year and the next year and the next year and just proofing every step of the way. And yeah, you could be proofing over really long periods of time. And I think, you know, the thing that we don't, we, there's certain things I think in when we talk about spirits, we don't talk a lot about, and, you know, it is about dilution, it, it's about yeast. You know, so many other things, you know, everyone focuses on what's the still, blah, blah, blah. Fuck the still. Jesus, man, there's everything else going on around it that's going to, like, make it taste damn good. So, you know, like, I, I think... always say, I always say <laughs> distillation's a few hours. Yeah. You know, fermentation's a few days. I mean, I could years. <laughs> be really yeah. rude right now, but I'm just going to be quiet and maybe when we come off Facebook. <laughs> Yeah, someone is asking about Richard Seal saying shaking the bottle. Shaking a bottle of spirits is at home in a small amount is very different than like agitating a tank full of raw alcohol that hasn't been settled. So follow what Richard Seal says there. I know what he's talking about. Yeah. And also sometimes with fluctuation, it's, it's about temperature. So if it gets very cold, that's where you'll see fluctuations. I get a lot of complaints from customers that email me saying, you know, we've got these bits floating around in our thing and I'm just thought like it's fine bring it up to temperature room temperature They'll give go. it a hug give it a hug <laughs> it'll warm up uh, yeah and it's just a sign of quality usually and um you know I like it and then there's tricks of proof like you could just leave it really high alcohol and it won't be an issue and and then like you know and yeah it's so complicated there's a lot going on there 
So I am looking at time, it's 8.30. Does anyone have any last questions before we come off Facebook? So any Facebook people out there, if you have any questions last minute, Meredith, if you're there, if you've got any more questions, girl, we miss you. We can send you the Zoom link. Um, then yeah, please, please ask. Um, and actually I'd love to know what, what are people's thoughts on the last two? Because I, I saw Christian was like Thick as Thieves number one. What does everyone else think? What's everyone's sort of favorite in the in the lineup so far? What what are kind of the ones that are standing out? Actually, weirdly, besides my two babies, of course, um, Queen's Queen Share is just it, it's just clicking. tease and fly at this point. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's all I do. <laughs> it's always like, like, yeah, I know. That's the whole point. <laughs> I love you, Sly. <laughs> um, so, ooh, where does the name Privateer come from, Maggie? Uh, so the name Privateer comes from the, uh, the owner of the company. His ancestor six generations ago was a privateer in New England. Um, his name was also Andrew Cabot and he made rum in colonial New England um, here on the coast uh, in the county where our distillery is today. And so he named it Privateer sort of after that legacy of being a, you know, colonial era distillery owner. Um, so Sly, can we go on a road trip? Hell effing yeah. <laughs> I'm there, give me an airplane. <laughs> um, so you look, I mean, guys, we can stay on. I, I don't know how much time Maggie has, um, but we can stay on a little bit um, after. But it's really interesting to see all of you guys like really different rums. It's really good. And I'm really interested to see Thick of Seas has gone down super well. So um, I'm going to be very, very interested to see what your thoughts are after I've let it sit for a little bit, which will be really exciting. Um, for those of you on Facebook, we're going to leave you now. Um, I just want to say something massive. Uh, I just want to say good luck to Maggie um, because you know, Maggie is one of the most amazingly awesome people in this business. Not women, people. Um, she is incredibly intelligent. She's incredibly giving of her time. And, you know, poor Maggie has been on every single virtual tasting I've done except Cognac Show. And I'm still trying to figure out how I can get Maggie to do Cognac Show with me in a couple of months. Um, but, you know, Maggie, thank you so much. You are an incredible incredible, amazing example of someone that brings not only incredible intelligence, but just generosity of spirit and beauty. So guys, if we could all raise our glasses to the wonderfully amazing, talented, inspirational Maggie Campbell. Salute.